Ben, I am so excited for this. I had the most wonderful discussion with your sister beforehand, but thank you so much for joining me today. Glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. And I, I hope she didn't give you too much dirt. Oh, she gave me so much dirt, but we're going to get into <laughs> that dirt later. We were just chatting now, and you said to me that you're an accidental entrepreneur. And so talk to me, how did you come to found MailChimp? And what was that aha moment for you? Well, you know, I always wanted to be a designer. You know, I, I, I loved drawing when I was a kid. I had a couple of businesses um, in grade school. You know, I, I used to sell, I would get those little 3M sticky pads and I would draw animations, little cartoon flip books. And I would sell those on the bus. Um, wow. and, and, you know, that's how I got my taste of business. And I, you know, moved on to selling candy, comic books, uh, my own comic books that I would draw. Uh, and, I, and I still maintain that MailChimp is really just the end of a series of pivots from grade school. But I, I always wanted to be a car designer. You know, I went to industrial design school. I kind of, along the way, fell in love with web design. You know, I got an internship at an appliance company and I learned how to design appliances and I was really bad. I was good at designing things on the computer, but I was really bad with my hands. I didn't have the dexterity to kind of use that X-Acto blade and cut foam models uh, like you're supposed to do. You you have to do that with when you design cars as well. I was really bad at it. And, you know, the mentors that I had at the time were like, yeah, you're all of these refrigerators are lopsided. So one of them, you know, gently nudged me towards the, the silicon graphics machine and said, you, you might want to try 3D rendering instead. <laughs> and so I, I, I fell in love with that machine. I fell in love with computers. I never went back. I learned web design that summer internship. Uh, and yeah, I got into that the next, the next semester and never went back. You mentioned MailChimp being kind of the result of a series of kind of continuous pivots. I love that description. When did you realize... Oh, oh, wow. This is a real thing. Was it a millionaire or 10 millionaire or international offices? When was that? Oh, this is real. It took me a long time to realize that. I mean, it was it was an accidental kind of a business. We built it for just a couple of our customers who were having problems sending out email newsletters. Our real business was doing web design. And it was just sort of, we built it on the side and it kind of got annoying to log in and use it on behalf of our customers. So we just made it self-serve. We just said, you log in, you use it and pay with a credit card because we're tired of cashing the checks or depositing all these little, you know, $50 checks. Um, I was driving to the bank too much. It's a great problem to have, but it was also very, very annoying that way. And so anyways, we made it totally self-serve and it just started to grow organically. But we never took it seriously. We just focused on our web design business. And I don't know, maybe three or four years went by. And we were so, we were exhausted from running an agency. I mean, the billable hours game, we selling to clients, we were bad at it. And, um, <sighs> you know, I, 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 one day I, I caught this episode. I think my, my wife was watching Oprah. <laughs> She, she is a night shift nurse. She came home, you know, she crashes on the couch and turns on Oprah. And I'm working at home and, look, you know, I'm coding away at some website. And there's a guest on Oprah. His name's Robert Kiyosaki. You should have him as a guest someday. He's up there and he's talking about passive income, recurring revenue and all that kind of stuff. And it was the first time I had ever heard about anything like that. And so I stopped coding and I listened and I said, this guy's onto something. And I bought all of his books, read about it. And I just started thinking, you know, who should I get into real estate? What kind of recurring revenue business can I do? Meanwhile, MailChimp's sitting here making recurring revenue, by the way. I'm like, what should I do? What could be the next business? <laughs> and then, and then, duh, it hit us. Wait, we've got this MailChimp thing on the side. And we, we took its revenue and we separated it from our agency revenue for the first time. We like, we used Excel. We drew graphs for the first time in our lives. We were like, this Excel thing's pretty cool. And we, you know, we, we, we color coded the revenue from MailChimp versus the revenue from our agency and MailChimp was growing and our agency was flat or, and kind of declining. And so that was all we needed to say, let's stop the agency business and let's focus on MailChimp as a software company. Can I ask what, what sort of level revenue was it then? Was it like a million, 10 million, 5 million? Oh my gosh, man. It was, you know, after a few years in MailChimp might've been making a few hundred thousand dollars at the most. And our agency oh business God. was making a little bit, just barely more than that, but it was flat. I mean, you have Whoa. to remember this was after the dot-com crash. 
So it was slim pickings in Atlanta, Georgia, getting website business. <laughs> and so we were making, you know, we were 100,000 heirs at the time. <laughs> Not even close to millionaires. I, I get it. But like, you know, being like at that stage three years in, respectfully, it's it's not like rocket ship growth. Do you know what I mean? And so I guess my question is like, when was that inflection point where it went actually very, very much stratospheric? Was there a moment where between years it really yeah. moved up a knee? Yeah, well, it was a sort of another accidental thing. You know, we kind of fell into freemium. Um, it, I, I talk about this quite a lot. I don't know if you want me to dive into it, but we we kind of fell into the freemium pricing model. And that was the unlock for you. That was it. I mean, and, and keep in mind, you know, it was like five years of chasing after silver bullets. Just, oh, this is going to be the unlock. And it wasn't the unlock. Let's launch this feature. That'll be the unlock. And it wasn't the unlock. Let's do this PR. That'll be the unlock. Never. And, you know, freemium was something that we kind of accidentally fell into. Didn't really think much about it. And that turned out to be this thing that kind of, I think we were probably, you know, in tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of, of users at the time. And then within one year, it was a million users. Uh, and then within another year, it had doubled again. And it just kept doubling for a few years after that, just thanks to freemium. Wow. I mean, it's always what you don't expect. We mentioned your sister at the beginning. I do want to touch on a couple of really um, kind of fascinating elements I discussed with oh, her. Oh, boy. Here um, we go. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I, I hope it's okay for me to ask, but she mentioned, you know, the incredible relationship you have with your mother. Um, I do with mine. Um, and she mentioned that with her funeral, you bought kind of every flower in town or as much as you could buy. And I just wanted to ask you, in terms of your relationship with your mother, how did she impact how you are as a father first and how you are as a leader second? You know, my mother... Um, she was an entrepreneur. She, she ran a, um, a hair salon uh, in the kitchen of our home. Uh, and so we always had customers uh, in the house and I was always helping her out, emptying ashtrays, you know, organizing the hair rollers and that sort of thing. And I watched money exchange hands. And I always joke, you know, to me, if I close my eyes and I think about business, there's a smell to business and the smell is hairspray and cigarettes. You know, that's what business <laughs> smells like to me. Um, so she... She didn't really talk about entrepreneurialism or business. She treated it as it was a living. It was a way to make ends meet. It was a way to help pay for the bills, you know? And I, you know, she was from Thailand. And to her, business is just something you do to make a little extra money. To me, being a little bit more, you know, I was born here in the States. My father is born in the States. He thought about business differently. You know, he was always talking about how does this unlock? How does this scale, you know? And so I always dreamed of my mother just scaling out of the kitchen. Uh, and she never really did. Uh, and I think there was a little bit of like disappointment in me that, you know, this wonderful thing that my mother did never really um, just turn into like the next Vidal Sassoon or something like that. Uh, and I think that's uh, that's that's kind of in the DNA of MailChimp, this sort of like this this understanding that small business entrepreneurs, you know, they might start small, but they're dreaming big. They want it to be something big and I don't know. I, because of my mother, I think I never, I never called our customers small businesses. I never said small, I would say businesses, or I would talk about their dreams of becoming big, but I never like called it. It's useful, you know, internally to call it a category, SMB category, right? Sure. Like in, internal reference only. That's what I would tell my uh, writers and marketers, but outward facing, I, I really, really hated to use the word small business because they have big, big ambitions. I love that in terms of kind of how that impacted, you know, especially the smell. I also heard about your father and the fishing trips. Um, yeah. what, a lot of you asked, what did you take away from those and how do you reflect on lessons from them? Well, my father, you know, the, the lake where we would go fishing was always about 45 minutes to an hour away. Uh, it was a really long drive. Whenever I drove with him, he always took the slow scenic route, the backcountry roads, you know, and it, it would frustrate me sometimes because I knew after a while I would start going fishing sometimes with my brother and we'd hop in his car and he would take the interstate and we'd get there in 15 minutes. So I knew there was always a faster path, but my father always took the scenic route. And, and you know, and I think that was a big lesson for me. You know, sometimes it's not always better to be faster. Hmm. And when we went fishing, he also did not just like 
stop, get out of the car and start fishing. It was always like another mile or two mile hike to get to where we were fishing. Always. He always took the hard path. And, you know, I would, I would whine and complain all the time. And he would make me love, you know, the fishing poles, the minnow bucket, all of this equipment, the tackle box. And I would complain and complain and complain. And I would always wish that there was like a device or some kind of transportation, you know, like Star Trek, just beam us there. I would always talk about inventions to make it easier uh, and and just complain that my feet were hurting, whatever. And he never said anything. This is what I remember most. He never turned around and said, hurry up, stop complaining. Uh, he never praised me either. He was, in other words, he was very stoic and he would be walking ahead of me and I would be whining and complaining. He would stop, turn around and quietly wait and then, until I caught up. And then when I caught up to him, he never said a word. He turned back around and started hiking again. And that was it. And I don't know, I think I kind of learned stuff's gonna be hard. It's not worth complaining. <laughs> just keep hiking. When stuff's really, really hard, look at your feet and just keep marching one foot at a time. Left, right, left, that's it. You know, he was also in the military. Um, uh, I remember one day, um, I don't know, they, they were coming back from some kind of training mission and it was families reuniting with, with all of the soldiers. And I had no idea that my father was, um, this, this head of this, I don't know, I don't know the platoon squad. I don't know the terminology, but I had no idea he was the leader. You know, my father was just a kind, quiet, stoic kind of guy to me. And I got to watch him lead this big troop, all these troops. And, you know, he would... 10 hut, you know, and then these soldiers would like jump up in formation and they would turn and do, obey his every order. And I'd never seen my father act that way. To me, it was like really violent or loud. I'd never, he'd never acted that way. And then, you know, he made them do what they did and then he put them at ease. And then he was just a very personable kind of a guy. Everyone came up, hugged him, shook his hand, you know. I could see that there are two sides. When, you know, if you're a leader, you do what you got to do to lead the troops, but you don't have to be harsh and vicious all the time. You can also be friendly on the other side. Can I ask, uh, you said about him not praising you there or, uh, you know, waiting for you, but silently. Did he tell you he loved you? Yeah. Yeah, he did. He uh, there were times when he would say that and there were times when he would, you know, say that he was proud of me. It was usually after me, you know, going through some struggle myself, you know, he would see me just improve myself in some way. And those were when he would reserve that praise. But other times, like if he saw me struggling or stressed about something, he would say, that's the norm. That stress is the norm. If, if you're not stressed, you're insane. <laughs> and, you know, I remember him saying that he was like, you know, people who are just completely calm, all the time and they never get phased um like even he would you have a calm demeanor that's leadership but uh inside you can be really really it can feel chaotic and stressed but you don't show it right but people who don't even feel that stress inside he would say there's something wrong with them uh, so anyways anyways he would never like appease me or give me that kind of like Oh, you poor thing kind of a stuff. He would just very silently, you know, and he would help me get through stuff. But it was if I prevailed, that was when he kind of reserved that praise. A calm demeanor, that's leadership. I like that a lot. I also hear that you're a cyclist. And so hmm. I want to kind of bring them together and ask, what does high performance in business and leadership mean to you when I say those words? When I think about high performance at MailChimp, the way that I ran the business, I, I never really thought about it as setting a high goal and telling people to crush it at all costs. Um, I would set the high goal and then think about what habits do we need to get there? So, you know, when I started getting back into fitness, uh, I got really overweight in the first 15 years running the company. It was only very recently when I had my first child that I said, oh my God, I got to lose this weight. I got to... I really started to think about it. I couldn't even run a mile. And I was like, what are my habits that are preventing me from doing that? And it was kind of like staying up too late watching TV. So I just like unplugged the TV. No more TV for me. And I would go to bed earlier. It, to me, that's high performance. It's sort of like looking at the roots of what's causing you to not be high performance and changing these core habits that are blocking you. 
not really chasing after running that mile. Like I, I tried, I couldn't do it. <laughs> it wasn't until I slept better, ate better, drank better, then I could run a little bit better. Anyways, it's about getting to the core of the problem. Uh, and I guess deleting habits more than anything else. What do you say to people who struggle with the discipline? I agree with you totally. Often it's too much alcohol. Often it's not going to the gym, watching too much TV. And they go, oh, but it's, it's a long day. I need my gin and tonic, whatever it is. Um, what do you say to them who say, I don't have the discipline. Oh, I'm tired. I've got kids. <laughs> I don't. I don't talk to them. I'm a little bit like my dad. It's like, if you want it, you'll do it. If, if people want something bad enough, they figure out that discipline. They just must not want it. That's, and, 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 I'm, and I'm a 48, am I 48 or 49? I forget. I'm, I'm close to 50. I'm, you know, I'm an old fart now. And you, you sort of learn to just stay in your lane. The key to happiness is staying in your lane and know, knowing when people need to be in their lane. And don't get in their lane and don't let them get in your lane. So, so to me, if somebody is just not disciplined to take control of their lives and be successful, they must not want it. And I'm not going to bother with it. What do you mean stay in your lane? I'm too interested. Oh, you know, people, everybody has problems. You got problems. I got problems. You bring those problems to my table. Hey, Harry, good for you, man. <laughs> I'm not going to take it. I'm not going to make it my problem. I'm not going to give you, I'm not going to, I'll give you some advice. You know, I'll probably try to get down to the core. If, if you really want advice, I'll give it to you. But I'm not going to be attached to making sure you follow that advice take it or leave it it's up to you well you know we have like 40 or 45 people across our companies now and i think my biggest problem is i have the savior complex which is you bring me your problems and i ingest them as my own i reflected on that recently when you reflect and it's really interesting now you're you know you stepped away from the role as ceo when you reflect on your own ceo ship and style of leadership how would you describe it and did it change over time yeah, it did. I mean, and, 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 and maybe in the very early startup years, I didn't have this kind of uh, stay in your lane. I know my lane kind of an attitude. You do just absorb everyone's problems because it's a life or death situation to a startup. So, you know, I just want to be fair to startup leaders out there listening to this. Sometimes you got to take all that on. I, like I said, I'm an old fart. I'm almost 50. This is something that happens as you age. Uh, Maybe a little older, maybe a little wiser. Um, I, I think that, you know, in the very early years of MailChimp, creativity was everything to me. Uh, and, and I was, you might describe me as, you know, bring on really talented creative people and just be very hands off. And I really do think that helped me in those early years. Um, and I, and I think that my co-founder, Dan, really helped vet to make sure not only were they creative, but they had a good work ethic too. So it, without Dan, I don't know that this would have worked, but, you know, I just brought in the best, smartest, creative people and stayed out of their way. And that was always my attitude. But I think once you get it to like 500 to a thousand employees, it's less of a startup or a company where everyone's kind of following the same mission. It's, it's not, you know, um, telepathic where everyone knows what it is the leader wants. It's like you're the mayor of a really, really big city and there are pockets and neighborhoods of that are just out of control sometimes or they're just doing their own thing. And and so, you know, I was told that my I, I got some coaching, you know, around two, three hundred employees. And they said that my leadership style was a little bit hands off, which can be good, but it was also eyes off. And they told me, you know, the the, the guidance was hands off, eyes on. And that was the biggest change for me, being trying to be hands off, but eyes on. And I wasn't used to that. How did you change as a result of that? You know, I used to just give kind of like grand big picture vision and I could rely on a small team to be that sort of telepathic and just get it done. Um, no, what you had to change is like be a lot more explicit about the goals um, maybe some KPIs, maybe talk about, you know, what happens if you don't meet the goals um, you have to rely a lot more on senior managers and, and lower level managers to actually manage people and hold people accountable. That's hard to do when you're a startup that's just sort of used to having a bunch of free range creatives do what they want. Can I ask, Ben, did you enjoy that? You are an incredibly creative, emotive, effusive person, kind of running process on individual little squadrons. 
It's yeah. not where I get energy from, and I don't think it doesn't feel like it's where you got energy from. To me, it was about the transformation of Ben. You know, and I and I over the years I watched a lot of founders. You know, they would they would evolve and they would say, "I'm more of a creative guy. I'm I'm going to step back from this and let somebody else take over." And I would always think, you know, that's kind of a cop out. I'm not going to be like that. I'm going to evolve. It's your job to get older, wiser, change your way. You can't be creative. You can't just sit there and code all your life. Uh, you can't be the designer all your life. And so I'm going to evolve and and do this other oper- operational in air quotes. I'm going to be more operational in my life. And I and I really think that I I got pretty darn far with that. Uh, and I'm proud of how far I got with that. And I was I was willing to keep on going. And I think it's just it's it's also important to be self aware and learn when you're not so good at it. <laughs> And I think that's the thing. I, so, so Harry, I think I could have kept on going and evolving and trying. And one day I just realized I had enough people just kind of say, you're, you're not great at this operational stuff, Ben. And then I, and I just kind of realized, you know what? The only reason I'm still doing this is because no one can fire me. So <laughs> that's why I've been going at it so long. So I started to lean more on operational people on the senior leadership team. And, you know, I was self-aware enough to kind of like step back in some areas. And then, and then after that, I started to think, yeah, I don't, I don't get a lot of energy from that. I really don't. I'm much better when it's sort of connecting the dots for a lot of creatives in the room. How would you advise other founders? Say you're advising me, we're in a coffee shop and I'm thinking about, you know, a new trait, habit, style of leadership. How would you advise me on, hey, Harry, just push through it. Like, keep going. Don't be a cop out versus, no, listen to your team. Step back, Harry. You're not meant for this. How do you advise them on whether to listen to which one? The, I mean, this, that actually happens all the time, Harry. Like I meet with founders. I don't invest. I don't do any kind of angel investing. They just come to me kind of as a therapist. They sort of sit on my couch and they just tell me all their problems. I really don't give them a lot of advice to tell you the truth. I say, oh, yeah, that happened to me. Yeah, that happened to me. And this is what happened. Boy, I had it worse than you, man. Here's how I effed it up worse. Uh, and this is what I did to get through it. Uh, but you might have to do something different, but that's what I did. And most of them are just relieved that they're not the only one suffering through this. Um, and I remember myself, I didn't have a lot of founders to talk to uh, in the early days. In Atlanta, there wasn't much of a startup ecosystem. And so I didn't have that. And, and I thought I was just the only one stupid enough to make the stupid mistakes that I was making. <laughs> um, so to me, my goal when I talk to founders was, is just sort of say, hey, no, man, we, we all make that mistake, all of us. I think it goes back to relationships, which is like, there's times where most people just want to be heard and actually yes. saying, yeah, I feel you. I have that too, is exactly what you need. Um, yeah. So I, I get you, but it takes emotional intelligence too. And I spoke to Lottie again, and you said before the show that she's you know, a brilliantly gifted business leader. She told me that you were world-class when it came to emotional intelligence, EQ. How do you feel when you hear that? And what makes you think that you're so good at well, what do you think she sees in you about how brilliant your eq is i don't know i'm conflicted about it i i know that i can be pretty insightful about people's feelings uh i was i was a really quiet loner in school uh i was you know i, I went to a rural country town school and i was one of like three asians you know in the whole school so we were we were i was kind of a misfit um and a lot of misfits flocked to me. They, I don't know why, but I was leader of the misfits always. And I think MailChimp is like the island of misfit toys sometimes. And I think those early years of kind of listening uh, and learning from a lot of these people who would come and talk to me, it kind of really helped me you know, like tune into the way people were feeling and what they were going through. But then again, the reason why I'm conflicted about it is I also have this flip side of me as a leader. Right. So I talked about my father, like being this really friendly guy. But when it's time to lead the troops, you you can you can be kind of cold or harsh on the surface. Right. You got to do what you got to do to me. I think that most people probably see that side of me. So anyways, I could be I, I do. I have been told many times I have a high level of self-awareness and a high amount of EQ. Uh, but I'm also told I can be kind of cold and robotic. Because uh, I'm pretty logical and I would just say what, what's got to be done. I may be in a more overly stoic way. I don't know. But, uh, you know, 
So I don't know. I, I'm I'm kind of conflicted about that, but. I mean, I had Drew Houston on the show recently, and he said something brilliant, which was, there's no nice way to deliver a grenade. Um, <laughs> and I think to that often, which is like, you know what, Ben, you're fired. So, like, <laughs> say it nicely, say it not nicely, you're still fired. It sucks. Um, so I totally get you. You said about kind of being leader of the Misfits set. And again, the joy of doing the show is I can change the schedule. Um, I was a misfit too, Ben, and I didn't have any friends for most of school. And it made me actually not great in business in one way being... I always want to people please, even when it's not the right decision, because I, I want friends, <laughs> uh, which sounds really sad when I say it like that. <laughs> but like, that's a really negative trait that I've taken from being a misfit. Do you think there are any negative traits you've taken from maybe being a misfit yourself? Ooh, now we're getting into some really deep psychological stuff here. Um, I, I think that for me, being a misfit meant that I was bullied quite a lot and I was discounted and disrespected quite a lot uh, through my childhood years. Not at home. I lived in a very loving home. You know, thank God I had that kind of shield around me. But when I went to school, you know, it was like fists up, get ready. Um, so I, I, I was always ready for a fight. So I was ready to defend myself. And I think it made me want to prove that I was a valuable person. And I think that that probably gave me this drive to be a great, successful entrepreneur. It just, it just pushed me. I had to prove it. So on the one hand, that's, that's really, really good. Probably on the other hand, it, you know, if, if I feel like people are trying to push me in one direction, that sort of like, oh no, that, that old instinct of, oh, I'm being bullied pops up again and I will push back and I'll be very cold about it too. Cause I, 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 I give no, <laughs> I won't give any kind of, uh, you know, no apologies, man. You know, it's just like, this is what we got to do. We got to do it. Uh, and I will not be swayed or pushed again, never again. And so what, what that means is I think, you know, sometimes you have to go with the politics and understand politics a little bit better. Uh, and I understand it. I get it. I really do. Uh, I do have that EQ to get it. But some of the, sometimes you just have that sort of angst from your childhood and you just sort of say, no, I'm not, if it's illogical, I'm not going to, I'm not going to concede or deal with that. So, you know, it, when you talk about bad habits, I think probably that's probably what I inherited from, from my environment. I think the m most kind of prominent lessons are from kind of pa quite painful times. Um, you know, I, mine are probably mostly from being bullied at school too. Um, when you think about the most painful lesson that you've learned that you're also pleased to have learned, which is kind of a weird uh, paradox. What would you say it would be? Just being a misfit was always this painful thing just throughout all of school for me. I mean, even through high school, even a little bit through college. Uh, but what I've learned in, in retrospect is that it, it made me think differently. It made me kind of um, stubborn in some ways. It made me kind of uh, stick to my guns. I think that that really gave me this focus to be an entrepreneur, a successful entrepreneur, you know, and I think that there were times when I think um, we could have sold the business early. There were a lot of people, you know, a lot of suitors knocking on the door, a lot of investors knocking on the door. And I think I just sort of had this like stubbornness that, that I didn't need that. I didn't want it. I was going to do it myself and I was going to do it my way. Was that always beneficial, do you think, in hindsight? You know, if you think, you, were, I'm sure there were moments when you could have taken 100 million, 500 million, a billion. Um, like everyone wanted to give MailChimp money. I remember that. I'm a VC for a living, Ben. <laughs> yeah. um, like, are there moments where you're like, actually, my stubbornness was not good? Who knows? I mean, there are probably some people out there who could look at it and say, Ben, if you'd just taken this money back then, you could have scaled even bigger. And maybe right now you, you would have sold for 20 billion. Who knows? Um, I don't know. Uh, there are some people who say, yeah, you would, you would have had, you know, a, a slice of the pie instead of the whole pie, but the pie would have been bigger. Um, there's no way to tell, but I do know that uh, when I look back at my life and my business, I'm really proud to say I did it my way. Uh, and I'm really, really proud of that. You know, there's there's sort of a Bruce Lee element of it. He did it his way. He came up with his own style and, and I came up with my own way of running this business. And um, I'm, I'm really proud of that. And, and it wasn't just, it was always collaborative. OK, you know, I don't want to say that it was all me. We did it our way. M might be a better way of saying it. Right. Like, I'm really proud of that. I totally get you. The thing that I also think about is, you know, MailChimp was, was it a 17-year journey, an 18-year journey? 
21, not that I'm counting. <laughs> 21, not that you're counting. It is such an ingrained part of your identity, actually, as my business is mine. I hate going on holiday, Ben, because I lose my identity. I'm not working, and then I don't know who the fuck I am. Yeah. So my question to you is, when you stepped away from CEO, how did you handle that loss of identity and losing something that was so ingrained in who you are? So one company, one great amazing leader tried to buy our company many years ago and you know I, out of a sense of duty i heard them out and ultimately i said no and he told me hey you're going to change and when you do when you change your mind can you give me first dibs and that, that kind of annoyed me i was like why do you think i'm going to change my mind why are you so sure that i'm going to change my mind um and he said you know you're going to think about life differently. Like right now you are defined as your business. It is everything to you. But as you get older, you're going to realize that your business is just something that you created and something that you do, but it is not you. And then you will be ready to sell. And I said, yeah, whatever, you know, thank you. I was nice about it, but I just secretly was like, that guy's nuts. Hung up the phone <laughs> and, you know, forgot about it. Uh, and this was, you know, maybe I was in my early thirties at that time. Lo and behold, 10 years later, you know, I'm in my 40s, mid 40s, and something happens when you're in your mid 40s. All right. And it happens to everybody. <laughs> um, their friends and their family start to die. And you start to reflect on life when you're when you're in your 40s. It is, and it's really it's one of those things where it's like you're just chugging along at your business. You're not really thinking about this, but friends your own age people you knew start to pass away they have heart attacks whatever it might be family starts to pass away you start to think about life uh and you start to think about how oh, whoa whoa my life is not my business and that's just a job uh it's just something that hits you like there was never a desire to take investment or to sell the company and it's just one of those things that just happens many many later many years later to to you so so you know i when that started to happen it goes away. This attachment that you have, it goes away. It, it, it just happens to you. It did to me at least, but I know a lot of people that can't seem to shake it. Like they sell a business and they keep on going and they start more and more and more. Like I, I just can't imagine why anybody would want to do that. <laughs> did you find the transit? Did you find the transition hard? Um, first of all, I don't know that I transitioned that hard, uh, but I'm still in the middle of this, right? I'm still at MailChimp. Uh, I haven't stepped away from it, but I am focusing a little bit more on innovative projects uh, and kind of being an advisor in that capacity. But, but I, I, was, I was lucky. I think um, we ended up using a company called Catalyst to be our broker. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you, you know the guys at Catalyst? I know them well. They're fantastic. They're like the best in the business. About 10 years ago, he reached out to me, you know, and I was like, I'm not selling my business. Go away. And he was just very nice. And, um, and he kept a relationship with me. He was very calm and patient. And he's very, very zen and philosophical. And we just built a friendship over the years. And he was actually a practicing Buddhist. When the time came to sell the business, like he was, he was probably like, finally, Jesus is 10, 10 year sales pipeline here. I'm going to close this. Anyway, anyways, he, 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 he went through the deal with me. Um, and before it was over, he said, Hey, I want to talk to you about this. I've, I've seen a lot of founders go through this process. And what you're going to learn is your entire life, your career, your, your idea as a CEO is composed of nothing but a whole bunch of habits. <laughs> and these habits are driving you. And these habits are making you do everything that you're doing. These habits are making you think about everything that you think about. And those habits are going to start to die off. You're not going to be called into meetings anymore. The emails are going to stop coming in. The calendar invites are going to stop. And it's going to feel weird. Uh, but what it is, is habits are being deleted and maybe you'll develop some new habits. But think about it that way. That was the guidance that I got from him. And I thought that was a little bit crazy, maybe. <laughs> but I have seen this start to happen. I've talked to other founders, too, that said, did you wake up one morning and, and notice that there were no emails on fire in your inbox? And I said, yeah, that happened to me today. And she was like, yeah, that's happening to me now. And so anyways you really do start to realize, wow, it's nothing but habits. You wake up, you check your phone, you do this, you do that. And, and they're good habits, you know, uh, that, that make you a great leader, but they are just habits. Uh, another thing I'll say, Harry, is 
You know, MailChimp success came very organically and slowly. So I, I have seen founders, you know, maybe that they were maybe overnight successes. Sure. Uh, and I think that, you know, going from poor to rich uh, can really do a number on your brain. Uh, I, and I think, you know, my co-founder, Dan and I were so lucky that we just sort of really gradually grew and we could stay grounded. Uh, so I think that just, you know, we, we kept some level of humility, if, I, if I'm allowed to say so myself. And I think that's kind of helped us not, you know, go through it, it, The transition hasn't been too hard on us. That was going to be my question. We're going to get to relationships to money, but you've been on the front page, the front cover of many magazines, um, lauded for the success and efficiency of the business. And, you know, you joke about, you know, being wise and older. It's still pretty young to have the success that you've had. And actually, especially when the magazine covers were there, how did you retain your humility and not let your ego get inflated when the world is saying, wow, this CEO, he's eschewed Silicon Valley and he's built the billion dollar business that no one else can build and blah, blah, blah. How did you retain your humility and not and fight against ego inflation? The magazine covers only happened in the last few years. You know, I, I just genuinely did not care about publicity. I tried to get the publicity in the very early years of MailChimp. It always failed. Nobody cared. They were, you know, they were laughing at the chimpanzee mascot. Nobody cared about email. Nobody cared about SaaS at the time. I could never get any publicity. And I realized you know, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm seeking that validation, right? Maybe as that misfit who was always, you know, pushed aside, I wanted that validation, damn it. Um, and that's what I wanted from the publicity. And then I realized, you know what? The only validation I need is a paying customer. When they open up that wallet and pay me with their credit card, that's validation. And so I rewired my brain to only care about that for many, many years. Didn't care too much about publicity. And then it was only in the final few years, you know, I, I got a chief comms officer who just said, you could use some publicity. Let's do it. It'll help us with hiring. We're, we're at a scale, a thousand employees. You know, we're competing with some publicly held companies. We got to get the word out. And I had read about, you know, other privately held family businesses that were very, very stealthy and quiet. And then every few years they would open the doors. Mars Candy is one of them that I read about. Like they would open the doors a little bit, reveal a little bit in order to recruit. They would <laughs> need to bring in fresh fresh employees, fresh blood, and then they shut the doors again. So that was really why I opened up the doors. I just said, all right, let's do this. Let's get some magazine covers. That's fine by me. Uh, and then, yeah, it, it happened. And um, But I think the fact that I had already been jaded on publicity, that's probably what might have kept me a little bit grounded there. And also during the entire time, I told, you know, I would send regular communications to employees just saying, all of this stuff that the magazines are celebrating, they're celebrating everything we accomplished in the past. But in the future, we've got to reinvent MailChimp. We were turning from just an email point solution to this multi-channel platform. So I was like, that's where we're heading. We are going to fail miserably at that for many years. And people are going to make fun of us. Um, and all of this glory that we had in the past, we're going to lose it. But... These magazines, they're talking about that glory back there. You better get used to hard times ahead. I kept saying stuff like that. Um, the first time we got mag a magazine cover, actually, you know, the comms team bought a big stack of them, put them around the office. They were so proud of it. But I always teach our employees to be humble. That's one of our core values is humility. And um, they could make fun of me. I didn't care. Uh, we had that kind of environment. And I remember somebody drew a mustache on my face on the magazine cover. Uh, and they threw a, threw a, drew a mustache on everybody's face, actually. And I saw that and I laughed so hard. And I was so proud that, you know, we have this culture that could just be brave enough to poke a little fun, you know. Uh, and so I, I took a picture of it, posted it on Slack. And I said, this is hilarious. More, please. And somebody in the company... Uh, Sean Cook, he actually had, he, he started an art gallery where we encouraged everyone to deface my face. Uh, and, and there was like a contest and like we had, it was like a brilliant art show of everybody, you know, gluing googly eyes on my face, uh, you know, just doing all kinds of things to kind of make fun and just humble us all back down again. 
I totally get you. It slightly reminds me of Willy Wonka kind of opening the doors to Charlie Chocolate Factory <laughs> and then shutting them again. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I, 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 I've got two more questions and then I promise to let you roll. But the first that I have to ask is like, in terms of the sale, why did you decide that then was the right time? Having gone, oh, this guy's crazy when he was advising you to, oh, I might sell now. What was that transition? Never really had a desire to sell, but I always felt it was my duty to listen to people when they wanted to buy, right? I would always learn something along the way. So anyways, we had, we had a couple of companies come knocking a couple of years ago and, you know, I listened to them. I opened the door and it went a little further than normal um, because there were pretty compelling offers and I had a senior team that you have to get your senior team involved, Right. Uh, and once they get involved, it's almost like um, they get a taste of blood. They're like sharks that, that are they're on the scent, right? And um, and they want to win. This is this is what like high performance senior leaders do. They want to win. And we got to the end of that process, and the the offers weren't there for me. Uh, and we ultimately said no. We didn't we didn't do anything. And that's a huge letdown for the senior team. That's, yeah. that's like you're coming from this high of like, and remember, these are people who also did not want to sell. They joined because we were a bootstrapped company, but we had all kind of got mentally switched and said, all right, we're ready. It is time to do this. And you and see your no. number, you see your number and you're like, ah, yeah, I would. yeah. And, and, and then, and then you take it away. And then, so, so I had this conundrum. I was, I was like, um, and I was sick and tired of the whole process, by the way, because it takes away six months of your innovation and your inner, you know, your momentum and stuff. It dis- it's distracting. And so I was at this point where I was, I was telling everybody, I was ready to tell them never, never again. I'm not going through this process. I'm, we're going to stay bootstrapped, self-funded. If you don't like that, it's time to go. Right. Cause the, I'm drawing, I'm drawing the line never again. And I was like days away from sending that memo to my senior leaders. And I got that call uh, from Catalyst and they said, this one's different. You need to listen to this. And um, I said, sure, fine. Uh, and, And it was into it. And I listened to Alex Chris and he knew small business. He had built a a startup before that served small business he, you know, he runs a small business, um, self-employed group at Intuit. He talked about small business in a way no other leader had talked to me about it before. He knew the same stuff that, you know, Dan and I knew. And that's very, very rare. Um, and he talked about it with a passion that I'd never heard before. And we talked about, you know, what, what it would be like to combine forces. And I kind of felt like, you know, MailChimp was at a place where it needed to go to the next level. I needed to hire another leader to get us there. Um, or I could join forces with Intuit and it could be like, you know, Intuit was like this big, this, this big jet, you know, the the ones that refuel the small fighter jets. And I kind of felt like this is like a refueling moment for us. We can just like connect, get pumped full of fuel and then take off, uh, with our mission and continue, you know, getting MailChimp to its, to its big act two. So it was very compelling. We talked for a year, by the way. The whole thing was an entire year of due diligence and sort of courting each other, um, you know, testing the waters here and there. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know that there was any one thing that said this is it. That was the time. It, I was really like hesitant about the whole thing the entire time. But it was really just, I guess, this compelling. It was just too compelling to say no. I had Ryan Smith on the show from Qualtrics and he, he talked about his relationship to money when he sold Qualtrics and you know, became a billionaire. Um, and, and I asked him, my, how, what is your relationship to money? And I, I ask you the same thing, which is like, you know, you move very quickly into different echelons of wealth. How do you reflect on your own relationship to money and, and how you think about that today? Uh, I, we didn't move that quickly. I mean, MailChimp was making hundreds of millions of dollars. And we were on the cusp of a billion ARR when the acquisition happened. So, I mean, we were already doing really, really well, highly profitable. So I don't know that my, my money profile changed overnight, really. Um, so I don't, I, like it's I said, fun, it's, it's funny, isn't it? It's gradually. different from a venture funded business though, isn't it? Because like in a venture funded business, it absolutely does. You sell and yeah. you get hit with like a billion overnight. Yes. And here it's like, you just progressed very nicely but continuously 
like an oak tree with really deep, strong roots. I mean, it's, it's just very, very slowly. And, and we had kids and that was, that's a very humbling experience to have children. My co-founder had two girls. I had two boys, roughly the same age. And I don't know, man, that just grounds you. And, uh, um, I, I always felt like, you know, I wanted my kids to see me. You remember what your parents did, not always what they said, but what they did. And you become what they did. And I always wanted my kids to see me working on customers. And when they would ask, you know, dad, what are you doing? I never said, you know, making money. I never said, you know, running my company. Uh, I always said helping customers. It's always my answer. And I, I just wanted them to be helpful uh, watching me. So anyways, that relationship with money, I don't know. I, I was lucky that we eased into it. And I just sort of want us to have the right attitude of, of being helpful with it. How do you think about bringing your, you know, two boys up um, in bluntly much more fortunate environments than, you know, you were brought up in yourself? How do you retain hustle and ambition and hunger when very different financial situation? Well, I mean, I used to worry about that a lot. Um, and then I realized the heart of that was that it was because I wanted them to be an entrepreneur like me. And that's an unfair thing for a parent uh, to to um, want in a child. I mean, the child, he's, they're going to grow up to be what they want to be. That's that's what I want to have for them, some freedom and independence for them to decide. So I had to let go of that expectation of them. So that, that was one big thing. Um, I, I also really didn't talk about money that much, and they never really knew that MailChimp was that successful. They just knew that I was maybe a nice, helpful guy to customers. It was their classmates. Uh, one day, one of their classmates brought a magazine with my face on the cover because uh, I guess her dad had given it to her and say, hey, take this to your friend. Um, and that was when they said, is it true that, you know, MailChimp is this worth this much, worth that much? You know, and I had lots of conversations with them. It never really intellectually they got it, but it never really registered for them because then, you know, they would say funny things like, you know, oh, there's this kid at school. His, his dad has a Porsche. They must be rich, dad. When will we be rich? <laughs> you know, And I was, you know, so they kind of intellectually got it when they were young, but not really because we never really acted that way, you know? Uh, and so it's, it's, I don't know. I, I am told by many people um, who've, who've, worked on home offices with super wealthy families. You know, it's, it's really just about how you live, not really what you teach or what you say to them. It's really how you act. And all I can do is say, I, I hope that they learn by watching us that we just try to, to be earnest and try to be helpful. Um, and that's and it. If you save up, you could buy that Porsche one day. One day you could buy that Porsche. <laughs> I love that. That's so sweet. Um, I want to move into a quick fire, Ben. So I say a short statement and you give me your immediate thoughts. Does that sound okay? All right, let's do it. So Lottie told me on this one, ask what books are capturing your heart these days? Oh my God. I'm, uh, can I say not business books? Yeah, of course. Because <laughs> I've read like, I've read like a thousand business books. Uh, I had this library down in my basement and I've, I had a flood recently and it destroyed almost all of them. And it was really cathartic to throw them all away. <laughs> <laughs> and now the only books that are remaining are sort of philosophical ones, stuff about life. I'm reading stuff from um, Thich Nhat Hanh. He's a Vietnamese uh, Zen Buddhist monk. And uh, Peace, Peace is Every Step is one that I'm listening to and loving right now. Uh, he's also got another one that I just finished called Art of Power, The Art of Power. Uh, and uh, it's, I think it's, I think I'm loving them because it's probably therapeutic and helping me unlearn some of those habits we talked about. Ben, what does a day look like for you? Is there like a typical routine to the day, if you were to kind of generalize? I never had a typical routine ever, even with the business. I mean, I was forced into it, but I never really like kept to a schedule. Um <laughs> No, right now, these days, um, it's, it's more like dealing with no routine. Uh, I, I just got a dog. <laughs> so, so, uh, you know, being in my, you know, I step back, I'm more of an advisor. I should be able to sleep late, but I'm not, I'm waking up at five 30. Like I always did taking this dog out. I mean, <laughs> the dog is keeping me busy. What uh, was the secret to the, what was the secret to the weight loss? What worked? Uh, a lot of riding and a lot of walking. Mm. 
walking is way more effective than people think it is. Yeah. Uh, and I've lost five pounds just walking this darn dog every day. Uh, <laughs> but, but the riding, I think, was a, was a very big deal. And um, stopping soda. Why are we talking about weight loss? <laughs> we talk about anything I want. It's my problem. Okay, all right. <laughs> oh, no. Sugar water. Get rid of all sugar because water. I, I know uh, the truth is I was like an obese fat kid when I was young. And so I'm always fascinated by people's weight loss journeys. Um, and so, yeah. I, I went, I'll tell, can I tell you? I, I visited my um, great uncle Clarence down in Miami one day. And he was in his 90s. Um, and he's a funny guy. And he... He used to be a, a, a truck driver for a dairy company. And I went to visit him with my wife. And, you know, I said, what advice do you have? And he, and he was like, really, he was skinny, like a skeleton. Uh, and he was diabetic. He was, he was quite unhealthy because of that. And he said, he told me, no sugar, no sugar. He said he used to, when he, he wake up for his morning shift and fill up his thermos with heavy cream to save time and get in more miles and make more money. And he would just drink from that thermos all day. And he said, that's what gave him diabetes. He regrets it. And he told me no sugar, drop soda. Don't put sugar in your coffee. Just drop, drop it. And you know, he was like a skeleton. I love that man. He was such, such a good inspiration for me, but he was a skeleton. He was like, no sugar. And it scared <laughs> the shit out of me. <laughs> So Harry, that's how I, that's how I lost my weight. I just, <laughs> it got scared out of me. <laughs> I love that. Um, tell me lottery tickets. I don't know where to go with this one, but Lottie told me again, I had to ask it. What is up? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, it, that's my wife and I were high school sweethearts. Okay. So we're in high school and we stop at the store and she wants lottery tickets. Uh, and my, my, my wife bought all these lottery tickets and she's, and I'm driving us home and she's scratching them off. And she, you know, she's not a stickler for details. My wife, she doesn't necessarily always read these instructions and she scratched off a ticket. And I think it was something like your numbers, your numbers had to match the winning number in order to win that prize. And she thought that your number had to be greater than the winning number to win. And so, you know, maybe the, the winning number was seven and she scratched off a 10 and she said, Oh my God, I won $25,000. And I was so excited. I almost crashed the car and I was like, Oh my God, this is so cool. We're rich. Um, and then she kept scratching and she said, Oh my God, I won another $5,000. And I was like, cool, but weird to win twice. And then she kept scratching and she said, I want another $2. And I was like, hold on, lottery tickets don't work this way. You don't win $25,000 and, and then $2. <laughs> so anyways, it was just this, so we, we were, you know, like so elated that we, we, we finally had money, you know, because we were pretty poor back then. Uh, we grew up in a pretty poor town and that was like our ticket out, you know, and no, we, we ended up not winning at all. And anyways, I continue to buy lottery tickets uh, and we joke about it to this day. <laughs> that, that, is the, that is the most like realizing depressing shit though, when you're like, oh, bugger, wrong. <laughs> it really is. And she still makes the mistake. Sometimes she'll, I'll get her a lottery ticket as a joke, maybe for a birthday and she'll, and she'll say, oh my God, I won, I won. Uh, you know, and it's you're like, and it's, you're like, welcome to a day of Mailchimp's revenue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, never mind the 21 years of building up this great billion dollar business. Uh, you won, you think you won <laughs> the lottery. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 help, help me out you're wise and you know seasoned as you delightfully put it earlier um uh, what's the secret to a happy marriage <laughs> oh my gosh um i i i have been i'm very lucky my wife was a nurse and she became friends with a lot of nurses who were older and so we used to go out to dinner with a lot of these older couples and what I noticed was the happiest couples had husbands who just kept their damn mouths shut. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and I, I just, I just kind of thought, okay, so they are repressing themselves. That's the key. And I think I've learned they're, they're not repressing themselves. They just learned that they've humbled down and learned that they're not always right. And it's not always about winning. And that's not, that's not everything is winning. And I just sort of let go and, and just learn to just shut up and maybe listen a little bit harder, not just at what they're saying, but why are they saying it? 
And when you listen that deep and try to just focus on why are they saying the things that they're saying, I don't know that it helps a lot. It just, it does help me <laughs> shut up. <laughs> you are just ultimately repressed to the point where you're reasonably rationalizing. <laughs> <laughs> it could be that. It could be that. Yes. But, I, but, but also, also, if I keep my mouth shut and follow her advice, things really are happier. <laughs> You might even Maybe get that's laid. More <laughs> <laughs> that is brilliant. Uh, tell me, um, speaking of kind of that, but like, what three traits would you most like your children to have? Uh, I, I would want them. So I, I kind of have a, an acronym floating in my head at all times that I, I thought would be like my my guidance on on raising children, and and it was bl- it was uh, bliss. So it stands for balance. Love, independence, and self-sufficiency. So what is that? One, two, three, four, four, four traits. So I, I, it's, it's really that. And I don't know, I, I, I was maybe, maybe self-improvement and self-awareness. Like I want yeah. them to just sort of understand, you know, it's about slowly incrementally improving yourself and, and overcoming challenges. Is it adaptability, perseverance, grit? Yeah. I don't know. What, what would you most like to change about the world of startups? I think it's happening, actually. Um, I would love it to not be located only in Silicon Valley in New York. Yeah. I would love it to just be able to, like with MailChimp, it happened in Atlanta. It happened in our homes. You know, I'd love it to be, just be everywhere, as, you know, tech startups, um, to not have to be in those two two locations. <laughs> Ben, tell me, final one. What do the next five years hold for you? What's your plan ahead? I've met many founders who've sold their business and then they, they go off and they want to do crazy adventures. And I, and I applaud them for that. And, and, you know, no judgments whatsoever, but some of them talk about, I've met one that wanted to explore the depths of the ocean. Uh, mm. One wanted to explore space, right? Mm. Um, and I've told them all, like, what do you want? And I said, well... I want to explore my own mind. I want to know why I think the way that I do. I want to know why I am the way that I am. And I think that's infinite. That's bigger than the universe inside here. Just getting to know that. And then I also say something that's really vexing, confusing, and angering to a lot of people. Nobody really gets me when I say this, but what I want the most is to not want. Huh. Just want to not want. And I think what that does that mean? What does that mean to not want? You surely you don't want now. You don't want for anything. You can buy anything. Yeah, I, I don't feel a desire to. I, I I feel if I I think it means learning to be content with what you got. Are you there and, now? And so I, I I met one founder who said that when he sold his business, he bought a yacht and he went to you know Greece and he dropped anchor and he was like, I have made it. And then a bigger yacht dropped anchor next to him the next day, a much bigger yacht. And he was like, oh, I haven't worked hard enough. <laughs> he was, he said he was, he was, you know, so happy when he got that yacht. And then as soon as he saw someone with a bigger yacht, he became unhappy just like that. Why? Why? And I think it's preventing that. That's what I have. Mean. You, have you, have you got that now though? I don't know. I think time will tell. You said five years. Why are you, why are you pushing me now? You said over the next <laughs> five years. Give me time, Harry. Ben, ben, I'm a VC. I'm here to push you. Your timeline, my timeline. <laughs> That's why you didn't take VC money. Um, listen, Ben, I've loved this. You are a star. Thank you so much for my incredibly prying questions. But you've been amazing. So thank you. Thank you, Harry. Thanks for having me. This was a lot of fun.